There's quite a lot to take in when it comes to the world of marketing these days. New technologies popping up left and right, and so many opposing theories are fighting for our attention. Clarity and focus seem to be the hardest to find, and both are kind of important when you try to put together a speaker lineup. So it only makes sense to ask the very best of the best. People who have built brands worth tens of billions of dollars today. They're a bit hard to get to, but they're out there. One of them was Professor Mark Ritson. When he delivered his fiery lecture at the 2019 Marketing Festival, it was by far the best received talk we've ever had. We immediately knew that Mark's emphasis on focus and strategy on becoming better proper marketers had to be the ground zero for our lineup for 2020. So yeah, we knew where to start. But it's not like we're gonna go all the way to Sydney and ask some more, right? Ahoy there, Czech marketers. Ahoy, how are you going? Um, uh, my name's Mark Ritson. You may recognize me from my appearance at the 2019 Marketing Conference. I'm sitting in a uh, facility literally overlooking Sydney Harbour Bridge. It doesn't get much more Australian than that. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be at uh, the conference this year. But the good news is I've already signed up with the team to come back in 2021, which sounds like a thousand years from now, but it's obviously only a year from now. Okay, thank you so much for taking the time to see us. I know we haven't got much time, so let's get straight into it. Um, I mean, we as marketers, we love to claim that our decisions are always evidence-based. So who do we turn to when we search for data on what works and what doesn't? It's kind of become this uh, watchword in marketing in the last four or five years to be evidence-based. And we really shouldn't need it, right? Because, well, yeah, evidence-based. What what other base is there? You know, fiction, uh, dreams, emotions. You know, of course it's evidence-based. But the reality is we need that term because a lot of marketing hasn't been evidence-based. It's been based either on not no real empirical data or it's been based on a biased half-truth designed to sell marketers on one thing versus another. So for me, I, I mean, I think because I do have a PhD in marketing, it does kind of come natural that if you're going to say something, you have to find the empirical evidence to, to underpin it. And, you know, that leads you to certain places. It, it leads you to Byron and Ehrenberg Bass because they are, uh, you know, fantastically empirically grounded in work. I also think they'll probably, the, the indirect benefactors of this have probably been um, Les Binet and Peter Field, because they were always doing their account, you know, their advertising account planners. They've been doing this for a very long time and kind of not getting a lot of credit for it for a while. And as we've become more evidence based, I think more and more people have become aware that not only do Peter and Les have evidence and have data, but the quality of their work, the application of their work, and the insights it is producing and has produced is, I think, you know, without exaggeration, the, the great empirical gift of, of the last 15 or 20 years in marketing. And I think it's the most important corpus of information, al along with how brands grow, that marketers could ever possibly read. So yeah, I think maybe Binet and Field, Field and Binet, you choose your sequence, are probably the great exemplars of evidence base not just because they use research but the research can teach you so much about what what marketing and advertising uh, can uh, do if it's done properly Both uh, earned the nickname the Godfathers of Effectiveness. How do you feel about that? Do you agree with it? <laughs> um, it's, it's very flattering, isn't it? It's a nice one. I mean, I, I like to say that um, we don't do the gangster side of it, but <laughs> otherwise, um, I, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very flattering comment. We're not the only Godfathers of Effectiveness. There are plenty of others out there, like Ritson, for instance. Yeah. And we're, we're part of a growing team of people who we would like to think are drawing marketers' attention to the fact 
facts and the truths of marketing mm. and trying to cut through the kind of wash of bullshit that there is about effectiveness out there. Yeah, it feels like there's a kind of a movement now, um, a, a different a, a set of assumptions about how marketing works. I mean, as you say, evidence-based and with a more sophisticated, nuanced view of how marketing works. Why uh, is it so necessary to perceive the differences between effectiveness and efficiency in your, your point oh, of view? Okay. So, effectiveness and efficiency are often kind of conflated and seen as one thing. Uh, but, they're, but they're very different, not just in marketing, but in the whole of business, the whole of life. Um, uh, it was interesting, actually, I, I was reading the other day, uh, Charles Handy, you know, the great guru of management, um, was, was talking about this very point about the fact that organisations often tend to become obsessed with efficiency rather than effectiveness. Um, um, effectiveness is about achieving your goals, it's about the extent to which you achieve your goals, the, the, the results you get, the outputs. And efficiency is about ha the ratio of inputs to outputs. I mean, what it effectively means in marketing is two very, very different outlooks. If you're chasing effectiveness, then as Les says, you're about maxing out the outcomes, yeah. achieving the biggest success you can. Efficiency means that, and that, and that I should say, is not about low-hanging fruit. Efficiency is all about low-hanging fruit. It's about quick and easy wins. And That's the budgets. way to maximize. And as Leda said, it's a ratio of what you get back from what you put in. And the easiest way to maximize a ratio is to cut what you put in. Mm. So if you want to maximize efficiency in marketing, you, you tend to cut budgets. You tend to do smaller activities that are very efficient because tiny amounts of money generate modest outcomes. But you will never achieve maximum out outcomes. It's so big and so important. I mean, if effectiveness is about focusing on growth, on revenues, it's about maximizing profit. Efficiency is about cutting costs and reducing the ratio of spending to, to outcomes. And ultimately, that, that actually tends to mean less growth, less revenue, less profit, because the most efficient business is ultimately a business which is bankrupt, which doesn't exist. You know, if you want to maximise efficiency, what you do is you fire all the staff, you cut all the budgets to zero. Um, if you've got revenues of one dollar and expenditure of zero, that is the most efficient ex organisation that could possibly exist. The most efficient way to have a business is not to have one. So I'll give you a good example of that from recent times, which um, bless him, Warren Buffett has made famous, is the Kraft Heinz thing. I mean, they've been chasing efficiency, like many, many businesses around the world, but particularly ruthlessly, to the point that they were not really investing in their brands long term appropriately enough. Um, and then suddenly you kind of wake up one day and you realise that the brands are seriously weakened, you start to lose pricing power, which is what Warren Buffett's very concerned about in, in, in businesses. Um, and they are now going back, they're reinvesting, they've realised the mistake and they now know that they have to rebuild those businesses. But it's about taking a long-term view rather than just chasing efficiency week in, week yeah. out. And we're not saying that efficiency is irrelevant, um, but it's secondary. Yes. Having worked out different ways to achieve your goals, then you work out ways of achieving them more efficiently. Absolutely. As right. soon as you yeah. put efficiency first, yep. everything goes yep. wrong. Too many people set the wrong goals, set the wrong objectives, uh, don't prioritise things properly, but they, they, what they do is they focus on doing the wrong things more efficiently. Mm. And that's a way to be unhappy in life, unsuccessful in business, um, <laughs> fuck everything up. <laughs> that's the first F word of the interviews. Excellent. We haven't seen one written yet, oh, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. we're going to get it. Um, we can progress to the C word if you like. <laughs> and that was it. All of a sudden, we were in the middle of a journey to understand the main challenges that lie ahead. Not for Marketing Festival, but for marketers in general. Look, for me, the, the big challenge for most marketers is to try and avoid what I've called tactification, which is the obsession with any of the P's, but especially the promotional P and, and especially the digital promotional P and to step back and rewind back through the marketing process. And if you really want to be a proper marketer, the first challenge, frankly, is to go back to doing a good diagnosis, you know, using your skills to understand the brand, 
the strategic context, working out what's going on, formulating a clear strategy, which has got nothing to do with tactics at all, and is about coming up with the, the answers to the, you know, the core strategic questions, targeting, positioning, objectives, and only with that in place, really then approaching the tactical part of the challenge. And the sad thing is it's getting worse, not better. We see marketers that are, you know, frankly, they've just graduated from being consumers um, in the sense that when you're a consumer, you never see strategy, right? You see the advertising, the promotion, the products. And so what we're getting is marketers that aren't very well trained who are going, well, I remember what it was like to be a consumer. Marketing's advertising, right? And a little bit of distribution. In reality, what they're missing is swiveling the process around and seeing the whole marketing approach, which is about diagnosis, which is about strategy, and then which is about tactics. So for me to, to properly get into the role of a marketer, a brand manager, a CMO, is about embracing not just tactics, but strategy and, and, and research and diagnosis as well. When I spoke with Les and Peter, they uh, mentioned that they feel they're a part of a sort of a movement for more long-term, more effective rather than efficient strategies. And um, apart from the fact that they count you uh, in that movement as well, they said that they feel they are succeeding in recent years. Is that something you'd agree with? Yeah, there's a couple of problems. So first of all, the significant and growing power of Facebook and Google here, and to some degree Amazon, are quite understandably very strongly promoting a shorter term activation message. Um, the immediate uh, ROI returns, you know, the, the click through rates, um, you know, the focus on measuring in real time what your marketing is doing. And, and, and I understand why they're doing that, and it makes perfect sense, and to some degree it's correct. But that really does push marketers to say, you know, if you can't measure by the minute what your marketing is doing, it's not correct. So I think ROI, which for me is a mistaken metric, is, is a big part of this. This is not some kind of hypothetical thought about this is This is the reality. The idiocy of the data-driven world that a lot of marketers live in, purely data-driven, where they think that brand is irrelevant and that all that matters is that I serve my advertising message to you in a timely and relevant fashion at the point of consumption. And it is, we've allowed it to become sort of a smart that that yes. is the way you should be spending your money. And it is idiotic. Uh, I particularly love uh, Peter's quote about the uh, about brand building. It's, it's essentially about creating these mental structures like memories and association, etc. And that's something op that obviously happens over the long term. And in short term, you can capitalize on the on that sort of a mental brand equity. Uh, what do you mean by that? How do you capitalize on the long term? What's the effect that you've researched? Well, I mean, what we've known, we've known this for decades, I should say, this is not new learning, it just got forgotten in the digital era, is that if you want to be able to drive powerful short-term effects, and we've known this for decades in the area of direct response advertising, that it really helps if you have a strong brand behind you, that if you are trying to drive people to respond, to buy your brand, if they've kind of never heard of that brand or they don't really feel very strongly towards it, it's going to be very difficult for you to get them to respond to your, your ad in the short term. You're probably going to have to offer them some rather lucrative deal. On the other hand, if you have taken the time over the preceding year or two to invest in the brand and build these associations that prime people to want to choose the brand, then it's much, much easier to serve some kind of nudge message to them that just reminds them of your presence or, 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 or tells them why they should buy you. And they will respond. And we, we've seen there are so many case studies going back more than 30 years in the IPA data bank of campaigns where we had all the response data before the brand building was done, so we knew exactly what it cost to generate a response. Then they invested in brand, and a short period of time later, some months later typically, the cost per response started to fall and the volume of responses started to rise. And that keeps on going you know, for a long period of time as you continue to build in the brand. So you know, brand building makes the whole machine work more efficiently, it turbocharges the short-term stuff, um, uh, as well as driving those long-term uh, effectiveness goals that you have. Most marketers don't have the time 
to do a long-term piece of strategy. So, you know, it's very hard to put a put a line in the sand and say how long is long term. You know, it, it's probably more than two years and less than five for most brands. So let's let's be arbitrary and say, you know, in a five-year period, if you took some of your budget, the sixty percent that Pete and Les talk about, and you invested it in longer-term stuff, and then left the other forty in short term. If you look across the the whole five-year period. Clearly, the evidence shows us that for the most part, you would get across those five years in total a much better financial return. But most of these marketers aren't thinking about those five years. They're thinking not even about the next 12 months. And in those situations, they are unfortunately correct that the best thing they could do in a sub 12 month world is to really go short term, even though across the five year period they'll lose out in the next 12 months they will get more money. So there's just not that belief in the investment in the future, even though there's an acceptance that it is long term the right thing to do. If you look at the world in a sub 12 month, shit, sub six month window, you should basically just do performance marketing, ring the brand out with as much short term ROI as you can, and then move on to something else. There is a stupid logic there. Mark, who's, uh, who's your biggest enemy and why is it Helen Edwards? <laughs> so Helen and, I, Helen and I are very, very old friends. Um, we go back, I would guess, uh, gosh, 20 years um, in that Helen used to be a guest speaker for me on my MBA course at London Business School on brand management. And so, yeah, it would have been 20 years ago, Helen would have been... Um, in my classroom talking to my MBA students about branding and her experience as a brand consultant, which at the time uh, and still is for this wonderful firm she runs called Passion Brand. And then what happened with me and Helen was I, I, I left the magazine I used to write for, which was called Marketing Magazine, um, because I was offered basically a, a better offer to go and write for a competitor magazine, Marketing Week. And the editor of marketing really wasn't too concerned about losing me. And almost as a parting question said, well, do you have any names for people that could replace you? And, you know, I half thought about it and I thought, well, to be fair, Helen's a good writer and she knows her stuff. You should talk to Helen Edwards. And so I felt kind of good about it because I was kind of leaving, you know, and I didn't want to leave him with a hole and I knew Helen was good. But then it, a really terrible thing happened because Helen Edwards started to write really good columns and win really good awards. Um, based on her writing, and several times, I, I'm, I'm uh, distressed to say, um, I would go to the, you know, the, we have the PPA Awards, which is the big award for columnist of the year in the British Press uh, Awards, and I was shortlisted a couple of times, and I would go, and then I would, I would get beaten by Helen. I think that happened twice, and I was thoroughly, thoroughly pissed off about that, and so she really did kind of uh, teach me a lesson, which is. The next time you leave a job, if you're gonna recommend anyone to replace you, pick a total fucking Muppet. So I think she's a really good brand consultant. She's a great writer, good presenter. And again, she knows her stuff. She doesn't just talk shit. She does the work and she knows what she's talking about. And that's very important. <laughs> In our conversation prior to this interview, you've mentioned that you are NDA'd up to your eyeballs. Yeah. So you, you can't really talk much about yeah. your current work or yeah. perhaps even your previous work. Yeah. But if you could, yeah. uh, what, would you, what would you pick? Um, I mean, I would guess that the, the center of gravity of a lot of the work that I do with, uh, with commercial clients is around what should our brand mean and stand for? Uh, and how do we make, how do we bring that to life across all marketing touch points? Um, and, and over the years, there's been a lot of work that I've been incredi incredibly proud of in that area for companies like BBC Worldwide, uh, for Avon Cosmetics, um, for Johnson & Johnson on a variety of their brands. Um, I think also some of the work that I've been really proudest of is actually for brands that you might never have heard of, which are where we've worked with VC-backed entrepreneurial companies to kind of get their business up and running. 
uh, because that's where I've learned a lot myself from the leaders of those companies who are often extraordinary, uh, who are building something from nothing, they want to create a brand, we help them create that brand and then they build it and sell it um, and those types of projects have been really exciting to work on. I mean, you know, just off, this, this is a really difficult one for me to talk about because I can't talk because I don't do work like ad agencies do, a lot of what I do is really business critical and the businesses wouldn't want the wider world to know that they've worked with a consultant. It's, so it's really difficult for me to talk about it, yeah, sure. <laughs> unfortunately. So I've really enjoyed your recent article on the uh, necessity to go back to extreme basics when it comes to marketing. What do you mean by that? I think, I mean, what I mean by that is, is for marketers to go back to, I guess, some of the fundamentals of their, their products or their brands in the marketplace and get those things right before they start laddering up to the big themes of life. And I think it, it's almost easier for marketers and particularly ad agencies to get into the big themes of life and what is our brand doing for somebody's life than it is to come back down and say, are we doing the basics really well? Are we hitting those points of parity uh, that we need to do to perform in the marketplace uh, in a way that's really satisfying the needs of the consumer and I think in so many categories that, that they're frankly just not. How do you make the idea of like sort of climbing down the ladder more alluring to marketers because we want to do the, the nice stuff, we want to yeah. technologically advance fluffy things? I mean I think I would say that it's their job uh, which is a bit of a hard line thing, you know, it, it's their job, it shouldn't have to be alluring, they should want to do their job well. Uh, but I do get that actually working on a new co communications campaign or doing something really interesting in digital technology is more, is potentially more fun. It's also, I think it's, I think the point of those things are that they're more controllable by the marketer. I think the difficulty of laddering down and getting into some of those fundamentals about the product or the service means that you have to engage with the rest of the organisation and you have to persuade them that this is the right thing to do and that's not always within your gift as a marketer, so it's tougher. Alright, hang on, we have to back up here. We can't really talk technology without the next guy and there's no one quite like Tom Goodwin, am I right Mark? So I've known Tom uh, Goodwin for uh, several years, and I, I, I guess Tom owes me, actually, if I could be even more blunt, um, because uh, I told Tom, uh, after we went out and got, I think, quite horrendously drunk somewhere, that he really should do a lot, of, a lot more keynotes. And the reason I said that was I was just so overwhelmed with how good he was, and also how shit everyone else is in his area. Tom sort of deliberately, I think, swerves all over the place in terms of his areas of expertise. But really what Tom does is that nexus of marketing and technology and culture and media, Tom kind of sits in that middle place. And I think he sees the world like properly like a guru. Like I hate anyone being called a guru, right? I think it's bullshit. But in Tom's case, it's kind of strangely true, right? Tom really does see stuff. I mean, I've used his quotes. You know, I used to write for The Guardian and he's written some stuff that's very prescient that if you go back and read it now, seems pretty obvious. But he wrote that stuff six, seven years ago and he's on the number. How did Tom Goodwin, the uh, graduate of Sheffield University, write? <laughs> yeah. How did he end up in a penthouse in Lower Manhattan? Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, it definitely hasn't been as sort of strategic and as clever as it might look in retrospect. I think people have this awful habit of post-rationalizing things so that every decision looks like a really sort of smart idea. Uh, but in short, I, uh, I graduated with two degrees. I did a, a sort of Bachelor of Architecture and a, a Master's in Structural Engineering at the same time. And that meant that I always had this weird sort of hybrid brain of being quite creative and sort of quite good at logic. Um, and it was suggested to me over a period of years that advertising would be useful for me. Um, so I tried and failed at a number of different types of advertising jobs, worked for a huge uh, company, GlaxoSmithKline. 
um, became fascinated by technology. So I think the big turning point for me in my career was working with Nokia. Uh, they launched these new handsets that did things that nothing in the world came close to. Um, I became very interested in the kind of anthropology of technology. And I think it's that approach and that ability to focus much more on people and to sort of empathize around their needs that's been really sort of helpful. So, you know, period of time working there, period of time working in new business, period of time working for digital agencies, and then much more future focused agencies, which brought me to New York. Um, and then quite honestly, I got quite angry with the types of conversations that were happening in the world. Like I felt like the world kind of bifurcated into traditional advertising people who had a lot of um, innate understanding of people and a very sensitive, empathetic, sort of soft people. And then there was the rise of the kind of technology people who were very co-driven, who were very sort of objective, who were very logical. Um, and these people were paranoid with saying that everything is different and that 5G would change everything and artificial intelligence would, you know, rewire the world and the eye beacons and VR and AR and headsets and voice. There was this sense that somehow everything we'd learned before was useless. Um, I strongly disagreed and I think it's because of the confidence of my degree that spanned those two areas. It just meant that I got quite good at asking quite provocative questions. So I'd write many articles that would try and shine a light into these areas. And I wouldn't be saying like these people are wrong and everything is nonsense. I would just be saying, you know, we need to trust our own, um, our own ability to understand the world and we should have our own viewpoints and we should have a big discussion about this material. And I think it's that that's led to me now speaking at a lot of events. Um, it's led to that that's allowed me to write articles which do quite well. And I guess that's why I'm sort of here in this apartment in New York. And that's why we're here as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that sort of ties nicely to my second question because you, uh, in your books, in your lectures, you talk a lot about innovation, paradigm shifts and stuff like that. Uh, but at the same time, you talk about the necessity to put the customer forward. Yeah. Um, how does the, like, these approaches seem sort of intrinsically different, <laughs> but yeah. how do they come together? I mean, they are different in that they are a very different way to look at the world, but they both face the same world. Um, I think right now, because of this sort of shift towards technology people making all of the money and having all of the stages and being celebrated by mainstream media, I think somehow we've assumed that our approach should always be technology first. So. It often comes to me that the brief is how do we make a banking app for the age of voice? Like, what can we do with voice? Um, I will get many requests saying, what does 5G mean for my business? Or how can we make a chatbot? Or why do we make an Apple Watch app? Would have been the question many years ago. And I think one needs to be aware that technology makes new possibilities. And technology does lead to this ability to have a paradigm shift in how we do things and what's possible. But ultimately, all of these things come down to people. Uh, and all of these things come down to how do we serve people better. And that really comes down to a much more imaginative type of thinking, a much more empathetic type of thinking. And it means using technology as the toolkit rather than as our master, in a way. And I think that's where we see things that become much more interesting. Because actually, you know, a company like Tesla is obviously driven by, you know, the sort of insane brilliance of Elon Musk. But when they create something like dog mode, where you can keep your sort of dog in the vehicle on hot days without uh, sort of having to keep the doors open and worrying about it escaping. Like that's a very sort of uh, human solution. Um, you know, Elon Musk does not talk forever about the lithium ion battery power. He just talks about the fact that the cars go far enough without you having to buy gas. So I think the more that we can humanize these things, the better. I don't want to finish talking about Tom without talking about his biggest and most impressive feature which is his hair i don't want to do down the rest of him because it is impressive you know his thinking his his ability to apply the thinking into media and marketing but you know it all does come a very distant second to the hair well yeah and you've got you've got pretty good hair like normally you'd be like the dude i think of that's got beautiful hair but he makes you look like a bald fucker from like 1962 you know what i mean don't take on the hair, you'll just humiliate yourself. You're a good looking fellow with nice hair, but the Goodwin hair is like celebrity hair, man. You can't beat that hair. I've seen women who just wanted to have sex with the hair, not even bother about the body, right? Not really sure how I can follow that up. Let's talk brands instead. 
more specifically brand purpose. Strong brands that people can really connect with generally have a point of view, a point of view that's bigger than but connected to their category. And that, that can be the foundation of a very powerful brand, not on its own. You've still got to deliver at the laddering down level, at the level of, you know, are, you know, are we delivering a product or a service that people really want in a way that they want it? But if you then connect that to a point of view, you then can become a brand for me, which is how you, how you become part of the membrane itself, actually. It might be useful for most companies to have a corporate purpose. This is who we are as a company. This is what we stand for. This is what we're trying to do in the world. That doesn't mean to say that your brands, that the company manages and sells, have a purpose. There, there's more than one way to build a brand. But would it be useful for most companies to have a corporate purpose that sets out their ethos over and above commercially what they're trying to do? Well. Yeah, maybe, yes, because we have to compete for talent and people want to work for companies that are doing more than just making money. So, but it's not about selling brands. This, uh, the next question might end up being edited out as well because of the NDAs and stuff, but yeah. do you think, uh, which companies do you think that are masters of this balancing oh. out? Uh, do you know what, I think, I was thinking about this uh, last night and actually I think a lot of the Scandinavian, successful Scandinavian businesses are really good at this. So if you think about Ikea, if you think about Lego, even if you think about something like Heli Hansen, you know, they, they've come from a foundation where they've always had a view that they're doing something more than selling plastic bricks or furnishing people's homes. But it doesn't turn into a big kind of corporate purpose about you know living lives or saving lives they, they stay close enough to what they do furniture or play but they, they always put it in the context of something bigger and at the same time they deliver brilliantly on those basics and they're hugely imaginative about how they do it I mean IKEA have broken the mold you know of how we buy furniture um, to the extent that they've they've sort of outsourced building the furniture to us as consumers. I mean, it's extraordinary. We go there and we, we don't buy furniture. We buy bits of wood and, and um, you know, and, and screws. And then we put our own furniture together, but we kind of love it. And that's an extraordinary thing to have pulled off. So I have huge admiration for some of these highly innovative, uh, but hugely successful Scandinavian brands, actually. And what, to name check another brand that I think does this really well is um, that some people might not have heard of. It's called American Girl, which is a dolls, a doll shop basically, a uh, US based. I think it's available in some areas in Europe. But what was what is now owned by Mattel by Barbie. But what what was amazing about American Girl is its founder story. So it was founded by a lady called Pleasant Rowland, who was a primary school teacher, and she was looking for a doll to buy. I think her niece. And she felt that there was an imperfect choice in the market because at the time it was kind of Barbies and Cindy's and Bratz or baby dolls. And she kind of thought none of this is giving girls a positive role model for the future. And why, you know, if we can't, how can we inspire girls to change the world if all we're giving them is a baby doll to play with or a Barbie that, that you're never gonna you're never gonna look like a Barbie. So she she developed she created American Girl, where the dolls that you buy there are based on uh, high achieving women of history originally and the stories of those women. Uh, and now you can buy a doll that looks like a person and and you can build them in the image of you. Um, and so they're dolls that inspire girls to be all they can in their lives and and that's been and that's a, a tremendously successful business in its own right the dolls are brilliant the quality of the product is great but she's doing something bigger in the world as well and i think american girl is another great example of a brand with a point of view actually yeah the purpose always seems to work when it draws on from the product and from the like the entire ecosystem that it creates rather exactly. than being installed on top exactly yeah. exactly the other lovely thing about american girl which an academic wrote a paper about is that when families go to american girl and they buy the do the doll for the daughter it's often a daughter a mother and a grandmother who will go together it becomes like a a girl's day out and they go to american girl the store and they buy the doll and what these academics found is that the, the brand, if you like, is also playing the role of intergenerational kind of bonding between grandmother, mother and granddaughter and helping and, and you know a granddaughter hearing the stories of her own grandmother on that day during that purchasing trip, uh, which is also a nice part of what the brand can deliver. That's the sort of thing that fascinates me when it comes to marketing communications because we are 
there's this tremendous amount of research that the creative is what makes an ad tick. It's, it's what makes it work. There's the research by, I think, Nielsen Catalina that um, attributes 50% of the sales driving force to the creative side of the advertising. And yet, we as marketers often turn to sort of boosting the technology bit. Why do you think that we keep focusing on, on that? Yeah, it's an extremely good question. Uh, and it's actually one that doesn't get asked enough. And I think the statement that creativity is at least 50% of what matters is something that we should have tattooed on our, our faces or something. I think it comes down to a few things. I think um, one thing is that the prevailing kind of wind is blowing in the direction of technology and software. So all day long conferences are about personalization, they're about better targeting, they're about building better data platforms, they're about you know, measuring attribution faster and more accurately. Like somehow we are in an environment where most conversations seem to be about that side. And we kind of don't really have that many conversations about creativity. You don't go to many events where poets are talking about great storytelling or where film producers are talking about the magic of um, story arcs. Yeah, it's got um, and, I, yeah, and I think that's because of the, the rise of these platforms and the capabilities they had. Um, they're, so, they're predicated so much on the technology they have rather than the screen that they operate on. And, and I think it's a big failing of the tech companies that only be focusing on targeting. Uh, like I myself have launched a few little things on the side and occasionally I buy Facebook ads. And I'm amazed that about 99.5% of the questions I'm asked are solely about the targeting. So it's what demographic are you trying to reach? How old are they? Where are they? On what basis are you buying? How do we optimize it? And then there's almost this last box you get to at the end where they're like, oh, can you give us the ad now? Um, so I think the technology companies have driven that. The one big thing I'd say is we have to understand that creativity is completely mysterious. Um, and it's a horrible realization in this field. But at the end of the day, we don't really know why we behave the way we do. Like, I can't explain to you why I bought this sofa in a rational way. I can't explain to you why I bought that TV. Like, we buy things in quite strange, mysterious ways. And advertising works in ways that we don't really understand. And what is a good advert and what is creative, they're not totally understood. So I think. In this world of objectivity and rationalization and numbers and data and this obsession with technology, it's actually extremely difficult to have much of a conversation where you say, I just like that ad, or I think it's a creative ad, or I think my target audience will empathize with it. When you don't have any data to support these things, it becomes a very difficult conversation. And what's happened because of this obsession with data, we now have lots of companies that will come in and talk to me and say, look, you know, blonde haired women perform better in this ad than brunettes. Or if you look at this ad second by second, you can see that this moment makes people outraged. And this moment is where people fall in love with your product. And it's just nonsense. In this age of this need to rationalize and understand everything, it's very hard to talk about uh, creativity in that context. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of people who sort of hate the fact that they can't, can't quantify these things. Absolutely. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. You, you feel very vulnerable. Like, um, it sounds quite strange, but one of the fascinating things about my career is it spanned the sort of pre-digital age and the digital age. And in the pre-digital age, we would put out ads and we would put out ads because the highest paid creative person would basically throw a fit if we didn't make the ads the way they did. Um, and then we'd have feedback like the client really likes it or the client's husband thinks it's brilliant or you know, people in focus groups found it funny. But th this was the sort of amount of resolution of, of data that we had. And we were kind of okay with that. And actually most of our ads did perform extremely well. And we built brands and we built taglines that are worth tens of billions of dollars today. And we did so because we sort of trusted that these people were employed in these positions because they were really good. And we couldn't say why they were good and we couldn't uh, sort of really justify it in any normal way. But it's like art, it's like music. Like there are just people that you have to understand are really good at it. Um, and it's really hard to work in that way now. Like even to have a quite a commonsensical view, you often have to sort of back up that that argument with data, which seems quite strange to me. There's one question which uh, a lot of marketers seem to be dealing with today, which is that we don't get to decide anything anymore. <laughs> um, 
in a way that uh, we only get to, we only get asked to shout at a street corner and promote the project, but we don't get involved in the uh, product development, yeah. the uh, the research and stuff like that. So what can we do as marketers sort of, sort of uh, get up the food chain, as Mark Ritson would say? And yeah. uh, well, again, it, it's a it's a fascinating question, and um, I'm sort of ignorant to the history of marketing to know when about this change happened because I think. You know, the very notion of marketing was about the four P's, one of which was products. Um, and I, I would guess at some point in the last sort of 40 years, maybe because companies have become so big, like the R&D team and the factory management team and the procurement team have become quite far removed from the marketing team. I would like to think it's going to be the next big um, sort of stage in marketing. Like uh, I think what's quite interesting about the rise of digitally native vertical brands is often these are quite small teams of people and often they've created products um, with a lot of data about what people are searching for or they've created products based on um, strong beliefs that they as individuals have had about underserved segments. I would like to think that that starts to make people in marketing realize that it's great to tell people about a product but it's actually much more cost effective to have a product which is quite remarkable um, which is serving a non-met consumer need, which is sufficiently different to other competitors that are out there, that while you will still need to tell people about it, um, a lot of the marketing will just be word of mouth and a lot of the product differentiation will be obvious. I'm trying to find some sort of a magic way to promote a shit product <laughs> as opposed to actually having yeah. a good one that Absolutely. solves somebody's... Uh... I, mean, I think it's a Steve Jobs quote, I mean, I'm not sure, but you know, nothing kills your product uh, faster than a bad product with a big marketing spend behind it. When it comes to fighting for clarity in advertising, you'll be hard pressed to find a stronger voice than that of Vicky Ross. In her more than two decades worth of experience in copywriting, she's worked as head of copy for the biggest entertainment brands out there like Sky or Virgin Media. She also worked for The Body Shop, Tesco, Sainsbury's, she's rebranded Paper Chase. I mean, there's a lot. So, Vicky, what pisses you off the most these days? Um, the, the, the bullshit. Um, for some reason, people take it upon themselves to go straight to the laptop or the computer and just type out a load of words that they would never normally say in conversation. Um, just marketing jargon and stuff that doesn't make sense to the consumer. That pisses me off. Do you think that presents a sort of an opportunity for brands to seize so that they can speak in more clear language to the consumers, like David Ogilvy put it? We all say that that's what we're going to do, but we don't. Um, I mean, that's a big generalisation. Obviously, lots of people do, but so many more people don't. And I feel like a lot of copywriters are always fighting against the client and trying to take words out. Like last week, uh, I won't say who, but a brand came to me and asked me to write some taglines for, for them, and it was their reference points were just lines that no one would ever say and so I said you're gonna to have to get another copywriter this is not this is not what I write you know if the customers not gonna say it then I'm not gonna write it um, all that sort of romantic poetry it's not poetry or romantic like join the happiness uh, like no one says oh I joined the happiness at the weekend or like I always have a go at car brands because uh, they write the shittest ads um, nowadays they used to be like the heroes um, so Lexus is my favorite probably their tagline is uh, experience amazing and again no one says that like how was your dinner oh I experienced amazing at dinner last night you just don't talk like that so we shouldn't write like that how do you think that the role of the copywriter has changed since you started doing it? Uh, I don't know, is the short answer. I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday and something came up that I found really interesting, which I hadn't thought of before. I didn't know what a copywriter was, or copywriting was, or really what advertising entailed, or how you got into it. And as such, I just worked really hard and asked people to let me write stuff and I got there. That's a very short version of how I became a copywriter. But when I think about the traditional route, traditional now, which is uh, you go to ad school and then you get a placement and then you're in an ad agency, I feel like the, there's an illusion that you're gonna go and make great big ads straight away and maybe a disappointment when you don't. Whereas my first 
ad, I thought it was an ad, see, I, I didn't know, it was a reader offer, which is, there's a difference, there's a coupon on it, um, was in Camping and Caravanning magazine, and I thought I'd fucking made it. I was so excited. As far as I was concerned, I had a full page piece in national press. Whereas I think sometimes now, junior creatives, are, they want to like hit the ground running and not do like the apprenticeship almost. Um, and, and it's pretty shit when they haven't got a massive campaign out straight away. But I never had that uh, in my head as, as something that was a possibility. So I, I was just happy with what I was doing at the time. And I just kept working at it. I think it was two or three years ago you wrote that uh, let's hope that 2018 and beyond uh, sees the birth of a counter trend towards more long-term marketing activities and we're just fresh off the release of the report about the crisis in creativity and the re relationship with effectiveness so how, we, how are we doing how bad is it well this is a I mean this is a, a slightly uncomfortable Situation. I mean, I do think there is progress being made on a longer term view of marketing when it comes to major blue chip organisations around the world. Les and I are finding a lot more traction, particularly in the US, to our mm. thinking. Unfortunately, that is not in any way being reflected in creative awards juries around the world. The creative awards juries are still increasingly rewarding the short term use of, of creativity. Uh, so, what we're finding is a, a constant drift towards what I call, uh, a lot of people refer to it as disposable creativity, you know, just a, a one-off idea, mm. perhaps around an event or um, some particular promotion. I'll give you a good example of that. One of the hugely celebrated um, creative effectiveness case studies at Cannes this, this year was the Burger King Scary Clown kind of creation. It's a global thing. Yeah, it's a very sweet idea. It's very nice. It's a promotion on Halloween. That is the life of this idea, mm. a few days around Halloween. Uh, it also, on a different note, happens to feature their key competitor's distinctive asset. Now, if Byron Sharp was in the room here, he would probably have something to say about the wisdom of doing that. Um, but, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to be unduly critical of it. It was a nice idea. It got a lot of people kind of involved and excited. But I think it is a misuse of creativity. You don't get the value out of it, it's very short term uh, and I think it would be much better if that creative firepower had been put to a long term Burger King campaign. Uh, because what they do of course after this is they just go back to the standard you know, $1.99 kind of stuff which is all very short term. Um, it would actually be much better if they said well instead of just being creative for one or two or three days of the year around a promotion which was involved giving away burgers, I should point out as well. Of course it was successful. If I give away my product, I'm going to have people forming queues for it. And they, there's nothing mystical about that. You know, I think it's a misuse, that's why. And we're seeing more and more of that. There's a drift away from the development of powerful, long-running campaigns that use creativity uh, to build brands and to create enthusiasm amongst consumers for those brands because somehow that seemed to be unfashionable or I don't know what it is. Younger planners and creatives and people working on account teams are just less familiar with the idea of building up a campaign. People don't talk in terms of campaigns anymore. No, absolutely right. Um, absolutely right. Uh, and, and if they do talk about campaigns, what they really mean is an ad, you know. <laughs> um, and I actually, you know, our chief exec came to me uh, at one point a year or so ago and said, you know, I'm really worried there's a younger generation that has come up, often they've come up through digital marketing, mm. who just do not know what campaigns and brands are about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we try to deal with that here by internal training and so on, but particularly if you've got people who've come into marketing yeah through the digital route, it's a problem because in digital marketing, it's, it, you know, you, you normally are just hired yeah. for a project. They haven't, they haven't appreciated week, the value of reinforcement yeah. and the importance of reinforcement. Yeah, yeah, I think very that's, often, yeah. you know, just the, yeah. the, the arrangement is it's a six week project yeah. and then, and then yeah, you're and done. I, you know, I have a lot of sympathy with that. I do understand that. I mean, the, I think the answer to that is even when you are given kind of short term projects is, is to remember the brand journey that you're trying to help this group. Mm. And I do, I mean, I think there's, there's also a lovely example of a Super Bowl ad, um, Super Bowl 
um, ad that was developed uh, in the US for Tide, the Tide brand, you know, which is it's, it's a Tide ad. Thing. So that was done in the classic way as a, a spectacular for the Super Bowl. But, you know, it's recognising that that was very strategic. I mean, Tide had been trying to own clean for decades, and this was a spectacular way of doing it. But also realising that that had legs as an idea, and it just has developed into a long-running campaign. Mm. You know, and it's, it's about understanding that even if you have a short-term brief that says, give us something for this quarter, mm. that that still needs to be rooted in what the brand stands for and is strategic mm. rather than involving scary clowns, for yeah. instance, which is not strategic, it's purely tactical. I mean, that, that thing, the, the thing you just said about does it have legs, mm. you know, when I first entered the industry, that was a thing that people said all the time. You know, you, you don't just assess the idea um, I don't know whether the, the phrase "does it have legs" might not resonate in Prague, but um, but it's it the idea is can it last and build? Can it keep going? Yeah. So um, so you know you would, you might come up with a great idea and go that would be a great one-off idea, but there's nothing more we can do with that. Mm. This idea might not seem such a blockbuster idea in the short term, but we can see a whole load, load of other mm. executions that. Can come off that. So yeah. the great long-running campaigns, I mean the one that immediately comes to mind is Specsavers, mm. should have gone to spe Specsavers, um, or mm. um, you know Heineken refreshes the parts that other beers cannot reach, or you know all these things, these great long-running campaigns where you can just think, oh there's a million ways we can mm. do that. Um, and I mean there are other ways to do it, so for example what, what we do here with the John Lewis advertising, which I always have to mention for contractual reasons. Um, but if you look at the John Lewis Christmas ads, they're all different from one another. But I know, because I've seen it, the strategic brief is the same piece of paper every year. Mm. You know, it's, you know it, we, we identified the strategic thought back in 2011, I think it was, um, and we've just used the same idea again and again. Plus, there's a whole load of sort of executional things that are the same. From year to year. In recent years we've always used the same director of that. What's the um, sort of the most uh, important hurdle that you're facing, the most important obstacle you're <laughs> facing as the executive vice president of Zenith today? Uh, if I'm really honest the biggest hurdle I face is that people either think they want change and they don't or people don't even think they want change but they say they do. Most people see innovation as this quick sort of garnish, this quick sort of gesture of change where they want to make the smallest possible difference but merchandise and PR the hell out of it. And in my very core, I'm a person that's the opposite. Like I'd much rather do things that people don't even really notice, that just are a piece of delight. Um, I'd love every website to just start using Apple Pay or Google Pay. Um, it would increase like revenue quite significantly, it would cost them about an hour of a junior programmer's time, but no one really gets famous or gets to speak at conferences or yeah. gets promoted because they did the Apple Pay. You know, so instead you have these nonsense things where they'll give out a VR headset for someone to use once or they'll do a flight across the Atlantic with biofuels in one engine or they'll roll out some you know, special program using an AR app where you can see how big the coffee table is in your lounge or something, and, and it all becomes quite silly. I distinctly remember a Czech sort of Shopify uh, competitive platform that created a VR shopping mall, <laughs> which on the, like the most basic level was the most misguided. This is not going to make the interview, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm do, just do. like, that was so <laughs> incredibly ridiculous yeah. to see. I mean, your VR shopping mall is a very good a uh, literal um, both metaphor and actual example of the way that we think about technology. Like We always think about these sorts of old behaviours and then we sort of digitalise them. So in the US you can now deposit a cheque by taking a photograph of it rather than thinking, wait a minute, like cheques are really stupid ideas. And to take a shopping mall, which is generally for most people quite a pretty, a pretty crappy experience, the one thing that's nice is you get to sort of be there with people and you get to sort of touch and feel clothes and try them on. So to sort of replicate all the crappy parts and none of the good parts is quite a good example of how often we do these things. We're in 2020 and the one thing I would push is if you're going to have Field and Burnett at the conference, you're going to have Helen Edwards, you, you, you will get a really nice ability to see a more long-term perspective. 
And I just think that the message, the most important message for 2020 is we're not against the short termism because there is no long without short. The, the real answer now is getting a balance, I think, in this year between the short and the long. And, and, and also between mass marketing and targeting, balancing those two out, digital and traditional. I think what we're learning is the tyranny of the or, you know, forcing a choice between one thing or the other is being shown up increasingly as, as a really stupid move. And increasingly, I think what we should be learning in marketing is a bit of both is actually the right way to go, everything in moderation. And I think, you know, as you go into 2020, long term thinking balanced with short term thinking is, I think, the right way to go. And I think, again, you come back to Field and Burnett, their most famous and I think most important work is called the long and the short of it, not the long versus the short, the long and the short of it. And that, that and is a very important word, because I think that's the key point for good marketers in the Czech Republic is for them to realize that they don't have to make a choice sometimes and actually you can have the best of both worlds and i think that's a great thing i mean you know again before i finish i want to i want to just again celebrate the greatest thing about czech culture of all which is the ability to say ahoy on dry land um, that's my favorite thing about czech people and culture and language but other than that i think the fact that czech marketers are intelligent and are more critical in their thinking means that I think they will catch on with that idea that they can have a bit of this and a bit of that. The Americans tend to be either all this or all that. Whereas my sense from my experiences with Czech marketers, albeit usually quite enormously drunk, is that they're open-minded. And I think that's long and the short is a, is a nice way for them to approach marketing in 2020.